Under the high patronage of His Majesty King Mohammed VI, the Policy Center for the New South is organizing the 12th edition of the Atlantic Dialogues Conference, its annual high-level gathering of influential public and private sector leaders from around the Atlantic Basin for open, candid, and informal discussions on cross-regional and cross-sectoral issues. Over 400 high-level participants will gather from more than 80 countries to delve into... Ladies and gentlemen, more the fourth Atlantic plenary session the will world. now begin. Edition, Please take your the seats. The will allow for different session formats. Over 10 plenary sessions and 380 talks will be on the record, available for streaming on the Policy Center's website. Two night owl sessions and over 15 thematic breakout dinners will be held in more intimate settings around the city of Marrakesh for off-the-record, frank, and uninhibited discussions. South-South Cooperation, the future of multilateralism, international financial architecture, economic nationalism, democracy in crisis, technology for sustainable transition, BRICS and NATO enlargement. Ladies and gentlemen, and the fourth plenary session will now begin. From Please take your seats. Selected from thousands of applicants will join the conference after a three-day tailor-made leadership and networking program. To know more, visit our dedicated website, AtlanticDialogue.org. Ladies and gentlemen, the fourth plenary session will now begin. Please take your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, the fourth plenary session will now begin. Please take your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The fourth plenary session, Perspectives from the Wider Atlantic, Similarities and Variances, will now begin. The Atlantic encompasses diverse nations shaped by unique economic, political, and cultural trajectories. The dominance of the Washington-Brussels axis is yielding to a renewed and inclusive Atlanticism that recognizes the historical interplay between the North and the South as a defining characteristic of the Atlantic. 
This concept of a wider Atlantic allows the region's countries to draw from their own histories and cultures, recognizing shared roots. Common challenges also unite by addressing issues such as environmental degradation, energy transition, global governance reform, collaborative financial policy shaping, technological advancements, and heightened conflicts. Despite these similarities, variations in political systems, economic development paths, and cultural frameworks contribute to nuanced perspectives on bridging differences. What similarities have the potential to shape strategies facilitating effective collaboration on shared challenges within the wider Atlantic? Can the diverse values and interests within the North and South regions of the Atlantic be navigated to establish a mutually beneficial arrangement for a more interconnected and prosperous wider Atlantic? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage our speakers for this session, Yusuf Amrani, former Minister Delegate of Foreign Affairs and former Secretary General of the Mediterranean Union. <laughs> Rebecca Bill Chavez, President and CEO of Inter-American Dialogue. and Erika Muines, former Minister of Foreign Affairs of Panama. And now, please join me in welcoming our moderator for this session, Foreign Editor at Financial Times, John Yearwood. Good morning to the Atlantic Dialogue family. It's uh, good to see you. Uh, you know, um, when we started these conversations about a dozen years ago, what we wanted to do essentially was to get the North and South Atlantic into the same room. But who could have imagined where we are today? We talked about some of these yesterday where uh, you're familiar with the African uh, Continental uh, Free Trade uh, Organization. You also are aware of what, was, what the, um, the G20 did uh, recently uh, with Africa. Who could have thought that uh, when we started uh, these conversations? We have an amazing panel to explore some of these. We'll be talking today about the challenges and opportunities that still present themselves. You know, I, I, I talk about uh, how things have changed uh, in the last uh, 12 years. Uh, they have changed to the point where now, uh, if you look at the narrative for our panel, it talks about it's a situation where the North Atlantic countries contemplate whether emerging powers in the South Atlantic might overshadow their international roles. Who could have thought about this 12 years ago? So we're going to uh, pick up on that, but before we start the conversation, I just want to make, make it clear that, again, something that we talked about a dozen years ago, and Karim referenced this uh, yesterday in his opening. I'm here to help guide the conversation. The panelists are here to give you the benefit of their knowledge. But the real stars of the show are you. So because of that, and we, we saw that yesterday where so many of you had so many questions that we want to give you maximum time to interact with the panelists. So, uh, we have reserved quite a, bit time, quite a bit of time in this panel so that you can do so. And in fact, we're going to start that right now. Uh, if you can take out your app, and um, uh, we have an interactive question, you'll find two questions. First question is about the challenges that now present themselves in this re-emergent uh, South. And also, the second question, is about the opportunities. Those are two word clouds. So uh, what, we'll, what I would ask you to do is if you could first uh, give us a word for the challenges you see that remain. And then secondly, we'll, I'd like to get a word from you for the opportunities that now present themselves. So if you would go into your word cloud, you would see what are the challenges of a surging global south. And I'd like to see what uh, you think some of those challenges are. And then uh, we'll look at 
the opportunities. And what I'll ask the panelists to do after that is if we can go a little bit deeper to talk about, from their point of view, what they, they see as some of these challenges that now present themselves. Uh, we're seeing uh, funding, competition, northern control, economic development, divergent, divergence of interests. And um, interesting. So uh, now then, um, if you can give us your idea of what the opportunities that, uh, that there are. Cooperation. People, demography, economic emancipation, north and the south. So uh, given the backdrop of uh, what the audience thinks, now we have the audience uh, idea of uh, what challenges and opportunities remain, why don't we now go <coughs> to the panelists, and um, Rebecca, if you don't mind, we'll start with you. Uh, what do you see from your point of view, given um, your deep, uh, not only knowledge of Latin America, but some of the challenges in Latin America, uh, and democracy and governance, why don't you talk about, about some of the challenges you see for a surging Global South. Sure. Well, I, one that I saw up there were um, just competing interests. And one of the things that we've thought a lot about at the dialogue is I, uh, over the la yesterday and this morning, we've been focused very much on the national level and also on the supranational level. But I want to um, talk about the potential of subnational um, collaboration. Um, and when it comes to the opportun you know, opportunities to facilitate wider Atlantic. Um, cooperation, cities and states can be tr essential players, and um, they're often overlooked. So yesterday, in particular, talking about populism and, and the inability, and we see this in the Western Hemisphere with the Organization of American Estates, for example, where there's so much polarization um, that it's hard for, people are starting to question the relevance of the OAS. Um, so strengthening cities as hubs for manufacturing, for um, investment, for innovation presents tremendous opportunities and also subnational diplomacy can be a very important driver. States are unique, um, cities and states are uniquely positioned um, to take advantage of bilateral and multilateral opportunities in everything from trade to um, educational exchange programs to strengthening cultural ties and um, the other thing about cities and states is they're at the front lines when it comes to addressing some of today's transnational threats. Um, another theme that's come, come up over and over again is the fact that today's challenges, climate change, transnational organized crime, um, global health crises, they transcend borders. And so no single country can do it alone, but cities and states can work on these issues. And the other thing about subnational diplomacy and subnational engagement is that it can be faster, it can be less ideological, and it can be more pragmatic than cooperation on the national level. So I see that as a, as a positive, as an opportunity. I th and if, later, if we want, we could talk about democracy, because I think one of the greatest challenges is um, kind of the degradation of democracy. Okay. Terrific. Rebecca, uh, what do you see as the challenges and opportunities ahead? Erica. Uh, Erica, I'm sorry. Erica, <laughs> yes. Um, I am actually going to back for a second on the question itself because I have some doubts about whether we should be discussing here the global south. So the global south as a concept, which has been used I think since 1980, was kind of an artificial way for people like me, we think of Northern Hemisphere and Southern hem Hemisphere. The Global South has a lot of countries that are not similar to each other. There's a mix of developed, rare, very rich countries, and then some that are developing, like mine from Panama. So I don't know that I love the idea of thinking only of the Global South, where you have countries such as China and India that are on the Northern Hemisphere, particularly because I think that we need we need to look for leadership within ourselves. So having an instrument that then later on, it's sort of like the competition of the Western, it's, to me, there is, we need to recognize 
particularly African countries and Latin America in my view, that there is a lot of potential in each other. And I mentioned this yesterday, together we're 90 nations. I mean, we're a powerhouse on diplomacy. Uh, but not only that, critical natural resources, there's so much that as an opportunity, we need to see ourselves and sort of leave a little bit the dependency on the North and try to coordinate among ourselves and recognize the power that we can be. One last point that I will add is that some of the challenges can also be transform into opportunities. Um, immigration in, in Europe, it's always seen or perceived as the African countries with this negative connotation of immigration. It's the same for us. In the US, there's a negative connotation of immigration from Latin America, and we need to shift that that framing to the opportunities that are in our regions rather than that we we're a threat. OK. Uh, thank you, Erica. Uh, let's go to Yusuf. And um, you know, yesterday, uh, former President Obasanjo of Nigeria uh, talked about uh, creating, uh, looking at how successful the South has been, creating this new organization, uh, Atlantic um, uh, Organization. Uh, you have been uh, the um, Secretary General of the Mediterranean, and I'm sure that uh, as he spoke, you were thinking, some of this sounds familiar. Uh, we're curious, uh, from your point of view, if you can talk about that, and certainly if you want to uh, mention what you see as some of the opportunities and challenges, uh, it would be good to include that as well. But before you speak, first of all, I'd like to congratulate you as the ambassador-designee from uh, Morocco to the United States. Thank you. Yusuf? Well, uh, thank you very much. I'm not really going to talk about, but you ask me the question, because it's very risky, because I have two guys here. One woman, see, the ambassador of the European Union and the assistant secretary general of the Mediterranean Union. So I don't, I don't want to be into trouble. But say, I want to say that for Morocco, the Atlantic is not only a geography. It is space where we can work together as partners in Africa. And I want to make it clear since the beginning that we are not going to turn our back to the Mediterranean, to Europe, because we understand that Europe and the Mediterranean is looking for some new tools. They have other priorities. They look more at the East, the Ukraine war. They have other, pos other uh, possibilities to partner. But we will continue to bridge as Morocco between Europe and Africa. Now, when it comes to Africa, I think it is a, a priority for us. And His Majesty has made a very audacious and ambitious initiative for, for, Af for Atlantic Africa. We, in fact, to summarize, His Majesty is proposing a new deal, a new platform for Africans to work together. Because today, we have no right not to move, not to act. We need to work together, we need to plan together, and yesterday I think I, uh, Mr. Obasanjo made a proposal to think about the Atlantic or to think about the organization. I think we should not rush. We have the platforms, we have the existing tools, we have some regional integration schemes which are working in Africa, like the ECOWAS, Fortunately, the Maghreb is not working, but we have the SADC because some countries of SADC are members of the Atlantic shore, like Namibia, South Africa, and Angola. So I think we, we need to put all our tools together to work because the challenges are enormous, as you were saying, climate change, piracy. And the importance of His, His Majesty's proposal is to give space also to some countries in some difficult regions in Africa, access to the Atlantic, like the people of the Sahel. So what we are doing in Morocco as far as investment, Dakhla port, you know, we come into details later on, that are tools that will allow us to draw up something coherent. Another point I want to make, this is, uh, and I said it yesterday to Mr., I asked a question to Mr. Obasanjo, what we're doing and what we plan to do in the Atlantic is not in contradiction with what we are doing in the African Union. Because we have, uh, of course, a free trade agreement is important that to build up on these tools 
to make our country, our continent safer. So we cannot wait. We need to work together in real partnership as we share common values. And I'm not talking about democracy, but we can, take about, can talk also about democracy to, to build up something consistent. So we have not, of course, we will in the future work with other, uh, with other continents in Latin America. I, I served ambassador to Panama and Colombia. I served also in Mexico, and I know that we need to know to, to think differently. We need to change the chip, because what is important and what is a priority is how we can promote growth, how we can create wealth, and how we can respond in Africa for the expectation of our young generation, me, women and men that are looking for a prosperous Africa. So we have to work together, plan together in real partnership to be able to face the challenges. And so for us, this Atlantic, this vision of modernity is an opportunity to, to use. Of course, and I will finish by that if you allow me, we need leadership. We need vision, we have that. We need the tools, but also we need commitment to these values. Without this element, we are moving nowhere. So we need to work on our integration schemes to enforce trade, investment, and also I will finish by that. It's not an issue for the government themselves. This morning I attended this panel, the private sector is essential. The investment is essential. And that's why we need to work on all this, uh, on all. But it is not, uh, no, it is not time to think about uh, creating organization because, you know, everybody today is reluctant. Everybody is the one it comes to financing the organization. Uh, look at Europe after Lisbon Treaty, they have expanded. Uh, create the parliament, uh, European parliament, uh, service exterior. It is sometimes difficult to manage these big organizations. Let me follow up on that. You talk about we need uh, vision um, uh, in order, and leadership in order for this to happen. Uh, are you convinced that there is among the leaders in Africa, that many of whom have been elected, some not, uh, that there is that uh, vision and leadership to carry out not only the, the, His Majesty's bold plan, but others such as the one that uh, President Obasanjo talked about yesterday. Uh, if we have the, the able leadership, right? Was the, this was the question, right? Yes. Well, of course, uh, well, we, in Africa, we have different uh, models today. And we had some difficulties lately in some countries with some uh, military coup and so on. But I think, personally, Today, I've, I've been, I just came from South Africa, I'm working in South Africa and in other countries, there is clear that without democracy, there is no way forward. So we need to have transparency in all the activities. We need to have, of course, all the countries are not at the same level, but there is today commitment because the people of Africa want this, this stable sp space. And we know democracy, we know respect of human rights, we know economic development and prosperity we are moving nowhere, so we have no choice. And they did, everybody has to follow this trend. Of course, we do it, we're doing it according to our own specificities, our own priorities, but at least, you know, we are on, I think we are on the safe way. Thank you, Yusuf. Uh, let's, um, now I want to go to Rebecca to pick up on something that, uh, that we've been talking about, the whole idea of this, um, renaissance that's happening in the South, as um, uh, one of our moderators, Sarah Glover, Sarah Glover, put it yesterday, and I take it she was picking up from former Senegalese uh, President Abdoulaye Wad, who talked about the African Renaissance. In fact, he's built a huge monument, some of you have seen it, to the African Renaissance in Dakar. Uh, my question for you is, is there really a Renaissance happening? Is there really a Renaissance happening? Well, I think I can, I can speak to actually answer that question and tie it to what Mr. Ambassador Designate just said about democracy. I think one of the um, challenges standing in the way of a renaissance, and here I can talk about the Western Hemisphere, including the United States, is, um, and it's part of the broader global democratic recession, is um, the, the challenges to democracy in the region. 
Um, you know, and what we're seeing, this was touched on yesterday. Um, well, in Latin America and the Caribbean, for example, or in the Western Hemisphere, we have three full-blown dictatorships, right, that are just, but what we're seeing is democratically elected leaders coming to power and then systematically dismantling democratic institutions. Um, you mentioned the rule of law, so stripping the judiciary of its autonomy, going after the free press. Um, we're seeing this um, growing trend of militarization in, in Mexico, for example, which is, a, is another major challenge to democracy. Um, we're about to have an election in the United States. You're coming at a very difficult moment. <laughs> um, and you know we saw the insurrection in the US January 6th, so um, I think that that is probably one of I would say one of the greatest challenges um, standing in the way of, of a renaissance. And um, I'm happy to go into details, but I think that if you look at the region as a whole, you know, from Argentina to the United States, I think Canada is, 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 doing, is doing much better. Um, I think that this is one of the overarching themes we should be, we should be talking about. Erica, what I'm hearing from Rebecca a little bit is that we shouldn't get too far ahead of ourselves as it relates to uh, this uh, euphoria about what's happening in the global south. Do you agree? Hmm. I, I don't know that we shouldn't get, I mean, like, so we are here, how long has the Atlantic Dialogue created and fostered this kind of thinking and ways that we can promote growth? And I think that we are there and there is leadership interested in doing that. Now, transforming that to action has been the challenge for the last few decades. Um, but there is more awareness, and we can see that from, from the engagement that you see from various leaders. The challenge is intra, so you know, within, say, North Africa or Africa, or even from Latin America, she was saying that within our own regions, it's hard to coalesce and to make sure because we not all see eye to eye. But there is this moment of recognizing of ourselves as our own power and the opportunities that are, and recognizing and trying to establish yourself, as, as I was mentioning, sort of, there are competitive advantages for everybody. And you just have to sway that, you know, whatever it is, whether it's in logistics, whether it's in supply chains, whether it's in critical resources, trying to establish that edge and, and look forward in ways that you're recognized as such. Uh, thank you. Just want to go to Yosef, but before I ask Yosef this question, I just want to tell everyone that we then now, after that, will go to the audience so that we can get you engaged in this conversation as well. So if you have a question, uh, please raise your hand and we'll, um, we'll get to you. Uh, Yosef, you talked a bit earlier about uh, the proposal from His Majesty uh, and uh, to take the lead on uh, what's ha to helping to develop uh, the, uh, the, the Global South. Uh, are there other proposals that you have seen that uh, make you uh, hopeful, optimistic about the future of the region? Yeah, I am, I am very optimistic. Do we have, yes. I am very optimistic because we the vision is very clear. We are doing, we need to do our own homework as Africans. And we at Morocco, we are working in the interconnect, interconnectivity is important, maritime cooperation, gas pipeline between Nigeria and Morocco and beyond to Europe. These are concrete projects. We have to be concretely on what can help the Africans to move forward. We cannot only just talk and talk. So we need to have to, to reorganize or to re-engineer this space in our country, but to, through concrete projects with the objectives of meeting the expectations of our young generation, as I said before. We have built in one of the biggest port harbor in the Atlantic, Dakhla, which will open opportunity to all the countries to have access. You know, I'll give you a small example. You know that to export a boat from uh, South Africa, Johannesburg, or, to, or, or uh, uh, Port Elizabeth to China, is cheaper and uh, less time than from Namibia to Senegal, for example. 
This is crazy. So we need to address this issue. This is something concrete. Dakhla port, the speed train. You know, it's, uh, some people may think it's uh, something simple, but it's important because it helps trade. So what we are doing now is actions, connectivity, and one element and one country alone. No matter its strength, cannot succeed to face these challenges. So that's why I said at the beginning, we need to work together and we need a concrete approach to move forward. So I am very optimistic. I think that we, we uh, of course, it will take some time because uh, we need these three elements, vision, commitment, uh, ambition, and so on. But at least I think I saw from my experience serving in Africa today with the free trade uh, African tree free trade zone with other instruments. It, it will take some time, but there is, there is a trend, there is a vision to work to building an audacious, a prosperous, and free Africa. Of course, this will also allow us to work with our partners in Latin America, for example. You know, I, I, was in, I served ambassador in Panama, I said, in Mexico, and I saw how trade, the free trade agreement, Jorge Castaneda is here, my former, former Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs of Mexico, how the free trade of Mexico with Canada and the US, and Mr. Rosenthal also, had helped to create opportunities for the Mexican economy. I, I don't think I'm wrong, but I think this instrument, trade, investment, help to move forward. Uh, Eric, you want to add to that? I just wanted to add something which I thought it was, it's extremely relevant and when he was talking about, uh, um, the ambassador was talking about the vision. So this is very interesting at this moment in time where we live on the TikToks of the world, the Instagram, the very immediate policy. So we need to fight really hard to make sure that all leaders throughout the world, particularly in the South as we're talking about, remain trying to look for that long-term vision. Because the kind of things we're talking about doesn't happen overnight. So you don't get likes for deciding uh, this kind of policy that takes time and takes investment from all the countries. So it is not easy, I, I'm pointing this out, and I am recognizing how difficult it is in now age where you have citizens immediately demanding concrete and very uh, results that are seen sort of in the short term with clashing it with this long-term vision that is required for everything, not just for the cooperation, climate change. I mean, there are a number of things that are looking at and that require that long-term commitment. Terrific. Okay, mm -hmm. now, uh, thank you. We want to now open it uh, uh, yes, to, the, yes. uh, to the audience to give you an opportunity to, if you don't mind, I wanted to ask as I walked by uh, the two officials that were cited, by Yusuf earlier in the Mediterranean to ask if they wanted to uh, engage at all in this conversation uh, to get some sense of, yes, uh, from your point of view, of what, please identify yourself. <coughs> and, I'll, and I'll come to you in a second. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Is that, is that working? Yes. Uh, is it? Uh, let me. There's a little button here. Okay, okay great. Thank you. Is that working? No, it's not working. Oh. <laughs> oh. Yeah, let, let's make sure. Yes. Let's let's make sure. yes. Yep, it is. <laughs> no, no it, it seems it's working. So hello and uh, good morning, everybody. I'm uh, Patricia Lombard. I'm the European Union ambassador to Morocco. Uh, I've been uh, in the country for, for two years. Uh, and I'm uh, very, very pleased to be here in, uh, in, in this uh, forum. It's the first time for me. So uh, very much looking forward to those very interesting debates. And uh, um, first, uh, I, I will make a point, starting with uh, uh, Ambassador's first uh, remark, uh, saying uh, uh, this vision to uh, the Atlantic vision is not uh, turning our back to Europe, uh, where there are European countries in the Atlantic also. So uh, that uh, uh, we will um, happily also uh, take uh, take the, that um, uh, that vision and contribute uh, the, to that vision. But to me, what I well, listening to you uh, is uh, is always the question that I ask myself: is what can uh, give the glue to such a vision? So Europe 
was uh, uh, the end of uh, uh, the Second World War, the ambition not to see a war, uh, such a, uh, wars again, and we started with uh, coal, steel, and we will move to trade. Trade was a fundamental element in generating um, uh, links between the European countries and many other things. Uh, and for example, if we look at trade data in Africa, I think it's like about 5% uh, of uh, uh, union. Yeah. So it's, it's very, very, very low what unites uh, the, the, the African countries in terms of trade. There may be other things. Uh, so my question to you would be, where do you think uh, that this Atlantic uh, vision, uh, can, uh, how can it be glued? What could be the, the factors that could uh, uh, help uh, uh, transforming a vision into um, a reality. So that uh, at this stage, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Excellencies. Uh, uh, I think uh, I fully agree with His Excellency, uh, Mr. Yusuf Amrani, because uh, he knows very well the Union for the Mediterranean as he was a former Secretary General uh, in uh, Barcelona. But also, I remember that uh, he was also beyond, be behind this, uh, the first initiative in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, as Secretary General of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, he organized also the first edition on the Atlantic, uh, Atlantic vision. So I, we should recognize to him this uh, vision. And now Morocco is uh, committed to, uh, to strengthen this vision. Uh, and his, uh, uh, his Majesty uh, recently in his speech uh, launched the debate about this vision, including uh, the Sahel and uh, the Atlantic. And I know that uh, Morocco as a nation which has, uh, as uh, uh, King Hassan II said before, that Morocco is as, as, as a tree which uh, has rations in Africa and uh, uh, look into Europe. So I think that uh, look into the Atlantic is not uh, uh, in contradiction with the, the, the vision to Europe. Because we should continue our vision. We had uh, two Secretary Generals uh, in the Union for the Mediterranean, also Mr. Sijin Masi. And Morocco is still contributing to strengthening the UFM, and we have our commitments with Europe. We have uh, the Green Deal. We have uh, several commitments with Europe. So I think as a country, we are able to work on uh, different levels in Africa, in the Atlantic, and in the Mediterranean. I don't know if we will arrive one day to, to have another union for the Atlantic or, uh, or Atlantic Union or any kind of uh, these organizations, but I believe that uh, to achieve regional integration, we should, uh, at the first level, think, uh, uh, work together and think about the future and uh, uh, having like uh, this kind of exchanges with academia and uh, we, we, we can uh, have a kind of uh, brainstorming to think about the future for better uh, integration for our countries. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, Yusuf, at the risk of embarrassing you based on the comment that we just heard, uh, do you want to t uh, tackle any of those uh, no, no, I, I completely comments. agree with Patricia. And, and, and I said that in my intervention, trade is essential. Of course, trade is very low between African countries. That's why we have this uh, new instrument with the African Union. The, uh, of course, this will take time. We're just starting. Even you in Europe, you start step by step, you know? And you were able to realize this economic space in the euro and so on after many steps. So let's Let's start. Let's work with this vision, with this commitment to create this space. Because when trade helps with stability, of course, we need investment. We, we, we need to do our own, own homework, but also we need our partners on board. I don't want to tackle the EU Africa because uh, this is another story. It's EU Africa strategy. And uh, the last summer in Brussels has shown that a uh, lot to be done. So. Yes, trade is essential. We, we're tackling it. And that's why for, between you and us, Morocco and the EU, I miss the EU, anyhow, no problem. <laughs> we're not going to work together, but we're still friends in any case. Uh, uh, as, as you think about your next thought, why don't we take a question okay, uh, from back here? Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for the panel for the, your, your uh, comprehensive overview. Um, as we look into uh, the, the cross-Atlantic partnership, it has to be built on uh, complementarity and on respect for the specificities and the characteristics of each side of the partnership. 
And, uh, and that raises the question, and that while agreeing that we should not uh, start with, uh, with uh, creating a superstructure that could be a burden rather than a facilitating factor at the, at the beginning, I think we should start by um, deciding what are the main elements, let us say four or five main elements that we will take as a basis to start this dialogue and uh, that could turn into a full partnership. Um, as, as, uh, as it was mentioned and as I heard uh, other speakers, uh, Yusuf, you have, uh, you have uh, vast experience in the Union of Mediterranean and also in Moroccan diplomacy and others, which uh, and, and this kind of partnership requires certain minimum common denominator. What are, and that's the question for the whole panel, what are the, the five major common denominators that we can concentrate upon at this juncture while we're starting this partnership? Can Thank we, you. Uh, identify yourself, please. Uh, uh, Magid Abdelaziz, I'm the ambassador of the League of Arab States to the United Nations in New York. And in the interest of trying to get to more people, if uh, maybe you can uh, address maybe two of those, uh, uh, give us two suggestions instead of five. Okay, I would say connectivity, transport and so on, energy, security, in and mobility. You can have two more, okay. Yeah. okay. And I'll give I, it to the I rest would, of the panel I too. would add to that um, climate and um, health, um, global health crises. Uh, it, you know that I, I wanted to add sort of the layer and maybe because I'm very focused on the diplomacy aspect. You know when you pick up the phone of a friend who understands and is going through the same, I see our two blocks as similar, but we don't pick up the phone enough. And that is not only for the opportunities. I mentioned immigration as an example. Like when you're going through things, going together and understanding, you, we would be amazed on both sides. We go through the same all the time, yet we don't talk to each other. I just want to um, add, and I know I started out by talking about subnational, and people are like, why are you talking about cities? <laughs> but well, the reason is, is it, to build on your point, is we've had a series of mayor summits. Mm. Bring, but it's bringing together mayors, civil society, and private sector from the local level on different topics. And one has been integ the integration of migrants and also changing the narrative on migrants because there's so much xenophobia in, across the hemisphere, because it's not just in the US, but it's the seven million Venezuelan migrants that are, are you know, Colombia, Panama, um, and having mayors get together and talk about how are they dealing with this influx of migrants? How are they changing the narrative to show, you know, show that migrants are, can, are not necessarily a burden, they, they can be a contributor to the community? Um, and then really tactical issues like how do you provide housing, med medical care, how do you deal with ch the unaccompanied children? And because of these gatherings of mayors, these, uh, it's been amazing to see that these networks endure. And so, so we had um, one on um, bridging the digital divide, what's happening at the city level. And the, the mayors meet one another and then they continue the conversation and they become that, those friends that pick up the phone and say, you know, hey, we're having a, a real issue in our rural, you know, in the more rural communities with connectivity. What are some ideas? Where are you getting funding? So um, I do think that subnational can be a place where you start to develop that glue. Terrific. Okay. Rebecca, thank you. Yeah, uh, my question is to the former mm -hmm. uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs. Um, in this morning, we had a discussion saying that there is really no place at the table or expanding the table at the multilateral institutions. That was the conversation that we had in the morning. So how can the global south try to do anything if we are already being denied where there is no interest in expanding it? And my second question is this, uh, from the Inter-American Dialogue. Uh, as I said to you before, I live in China, and China has been responsible for a lot of the growth that we have seen in the world but over the last few years, we have seen the United States somehow engaging and trying to dilute that growth. And somehow the world's not going the same way. This is the numbers. This is what the, uh, World, Trade, uh, the World Trade Organization said, also the World Bank. So isn't it time for us to go back into the issue of globalization and stop this idea of de-risking the whole thing that somehow is not leading us much further? 
Terrific. So uh, the China question, I think, is an excellent one. And what I would say here, and I served in the Obama administration, but I would say that the U.S. response to, we talk a lot about the Chinese, growing Chinese presence in the region. First of all, I don't think that's the, the lens we should look at Latin America with, but unfortunately, I think it's very um, representative of how the U.S. looks at Latin America in general. It's reactive. Oh, migration, we gotta focus. Oh, it's um, drugs, we have to focus. Oh, it's China, we have to focus. But even though we're talking a lot about China, the US is not engaging in the region other than in Central America because of domestic politics and migration. So the Trump policy was to go to the region and say, hey, you've got to choose between the US and the United States. And he used pretty nasty language sometimes um, without offering alternatives. I would say with the Biden administration, we're also, we continue to go to the region and say, hey, don't, don't work with China, work, work with the United States, but we, we are still failing to provide an alternative to China. Um, and I think that that is um, a shortcoming. I, I, um, it's a lot easier for me to criticize now that I'm not in government, but it's, it's um, I think until we can show that we are a reliable partner, that we offer an alternative, it's, I don't, I, don't, I don't think we can expect much. Um, on the multilateral platform denying us a seat, um, I've said this before, the multilateral platform as a whole is ready for a revamp. It served its purpose a long time ago, and we can go institution by institution. I'll just mention the UN Security Council as an example of <coughs> a new, in my view, failure um, to voice the majority of the countries. But I go back to my earlier comment, we're 90 countries together. If we were to reclaim our power, we would be in a position that we weren't before to sort of reclaim that power and create and expand the table to a way that actually, and in norms that actually suits the majority. Okay, let's take a question here and then a question. If, if, if we'll take this one and then we'll come to you. Okay. If you could identify uh, yourself. Uh, Carlos Malamud, El Cano Royal Institute of Spain. Uh, of course, opportunity and commitment are key elements to stress by regional uh, relationship between Africa and Latin America. But you need also unity. For example, in Latin America, fragmentation is essential to understand what happened in the region. And with from a fragmented region, you couldn't go forward in stress by regional relationship. CELAC, the Latin American Caribbean community of states, is an inefficient uh, institution. So how we could move forward to advance in this goal? Okay. Uh, who wants to? Yes, uh, take that. Uh, it's para uh, mí. Debo responder en español, no todo. Do you mind if I answer in Spanish? Well, I believe that, as I said this morning, there is a crisis, uh, or that multilateralism is going through a crisis. The Bretton Woods institutions are now failing to respond to the ambitions and the expectations of our people. The ambassador is here, yes. Well, the United Nations, the revamp uh, or of the uh, Security Council is not quite here yet. So this is my answer. We need to work together as the countries in the South, as the minister said. There are some initiatives up and running. The latest one being the one from or in Johannesburg, the initiatives led by the BRICS countries. I mean, there are ways to reform the institution. Of course, it is not an easy path because there is a lack of unity. We are divided sometimes in the vision of how this reform should take place. But we, the countries in the South, cannot wait any longer. We need to do our homework and we need to insist on a global reform of this system. As Dominique Strauss-Kahn was saying earlier, it is very difficult to have access to our funding for our, our countries. We need to work together. I mean, that is the answer. It's going to take time for sure, 
and I'm sure you will agree, right? English. Okay. Um, I think that what you're describing is a real challenge. The fragmentation yeah. in Latin America and the Caribbean is <coughs> a huge issue. You mentioned CELAC. We're seeing it in the um, Organization of American States. Right now, there's an effort to, you know, to me, the crown jewel of the Organization of American States and the Inter-American System is the Inter-American Democratic Charter. I talked about what's happening in the region. We're not invoking the Inter-American Democratic Charter. I mean, there are egregious assaults on democracy that are going on. Um, and um, something so fundamental isn't, isn't, isn't being used. You know, there's been talk about, for, for example, creating some sort of early warning system for democratic decay. We can't even agree on, on that. So, um, and that's just one of many examples. Um, and also, I would just on the issue of multilateralism, I think that we have a U.S. president right now, um, despite my, my critique, <laughs> who believes in multilateralism. <laughs> A year from now, we might not. Okay. Great. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. There's a question here. Thank you. Very interesting discussion. Uh, Rebecca, you mentioned something about the democracy and its implication on cooperation. I'd like to maybe to, to kind of zoom in on there. The erosion of the democracy, mo North America in particular, the attack on academic freedom, the, the, the directed uh, media, all of those are signs that uh, it's going to continue because there are a lot of its implication on financing and, and who's financing the, the media. How can we protect what we have? Okay. Thank you, Rev. Rebecca, before you answer, uh, we have about 30 minutes left. Uh, so I'm going to take um, several questions in a row. I'll have uh, a number of people um, uh, get up and ask questions. And if you can please identify yourself. Yes. And then uh, we'll t hand it back to the panel to comment on any of the questions that they have heard, so um, please. I'm Halima Jundi and I'm a researcher. Um, do you think in this, I mean, my question is for the panel, do you think in this turmoil world where we live today, there's still room for um, strategic and sustainable and long-lasting uh, partnerships? Of course, thank you, uh, please. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Charles Dahan, I'm from Washington, D.C. First of all, I want to I'm so proud of having our future Moroccan ambassador in Washington. Thank you. Uh, Good luck. I can't wait. <laughs> I can't wait to work with you. Uh, I have a big question. Um, we've talked about all the cooperation and the, and, the, and the investment and the development of the South Atlantic countries. Uh, but there is a factor that is always uh, the, the sand in the oil, and um, it's the security. Uh, there is a lot of other challenge of uh, good governance, terrorism. Um, that need to be addressed for, for company to be able to invest and, and help uh, the development of this area. We'll take a uh, final question here. Hamid Ben Ibrahim Al Andalusi, Casablanca. Casablanca. Ambassador Amrani. Ambassador Amrani has pointed out rightly, rightfully, the very important role of connectivity. Uh, you've talked about the maritime, but I would like and dwell on the role of the air transport is essential. We do have the experience of the national carrier, the Rally Amarok, that has uh, uh, developed its relations uh, and connections on Africa. We've seen as to how the African network has been able to create a whole dynamic in uh, meeting and allowing people to meet, uh, the business to thrive. I think it is essential that the airlines play a pivotal role in this uh, uh, Atlantic strategy and to start by a open skies, real open skies in Africa. I'll give the panel an opportunity to answer any of the questions that uh, you just heard or any comments that you might have. Do you want to I, sure, I'll, I'll start. So on the strategic partnership as well as Carla's question on where, how do you find this with all the challenges? I think where there's a will, there's a way. And what we're doing here, <coughs> and hopefully out of research, policy papers and all this, is to show the opportunity. 
we need to make sure that all our leaders see the opportunity and where there is the will that we need and it's not fully there, but we need to make sure that it's there, there will be a way. And the easiest way to collaborate right now is on an issue by issue basis. You can take, for instance, climate change, where there was a great initiative started on the Caribbean and that most Latin American countries have signed up. Um, and you can see sort of the mirroring effect on African countries. And that is the same for a number of things. When we were looking for vaccines, I remember reaching out to African countries and understanding how they were purchasing. So if you go on an issue by issue basis, there is a way to actually create and you need to find the opportunities. And on the second point on in the midst of turmoil, and I, yesterday we talked a lot about trust. I've been doing research on trust for a year now at Harvard, and uh, I'm very interested in trying to show, particularly at the level of leadership, how can you develop trust nowadays with everything that's happening. And I am convinced that the more and more that it's a transparent agenda, so 40 years from uh, ago or 50 years ago, we used to think of diplomacy as the side room or the negotiations that nobody heard of. I, I think that leaders cultivate trust, the more transparent they are with their citizens, but also with other leaders. So you gain trust by always having the same agenda. If you tell to another country something and then they find out that you're doing a side deal with a third country, it erodes trust. So there is a way and we need to figure out this new world where we live, where we have to be very accountable and very transparent. Uh, Rebecca? So on the question about democracy and um, kind of preventing democratic um, backsliding, I think that there are examples, I think civil society, I mean, I think it's difficult when there is this shrinking civic space that we're seeing in some countries, but I think we're seeing the role of civil society today in Guatemala, for example, playing a very important role, ensuring that President-elect Arevalo actually assumes the presidency on January 14th. Um, but I also, I also um, think that a big challenge for democracy is that it doesn't deliver. Um, there's a perception that it doesn't deliver. So um, the support for democracy in Latin America has declined um, quite dramatically over the last decade. It's now about 60% um, of, um, of citizens in Latin America and the Caribbean support, say that democracy is the best form of um, government, and only 40% say it performs well. As a result of that, they're willing to and I think probably the best example is what's happening in El Salvador, where you have a president who is, has about an 80, at least 80% popularity, and citizens are willing to forego basic kind of due process because the level, the democratic, the more kind of liberal democrat, but I think you can cr question where El Salvador was on this continuum before, but um, pe people are willing to sacrifice certain freedoms that are in part of democracy in order to be able to walk down the street safely. So you know, in this case, it's President Bukele who is um, basically locking, just locking people up if you have a tattoo. It doesn't matter you know, what, it, what, how old you are, but people are like, hey, this is much more important to me than these abstract ideas of democracy. So I think a key challenge for leaders globally, um, democratically, democratic leaders, liberal democracies, is to, um, it's no easy task, but um, to ensure that democracy delivers and fulfills, meets the most basic needs of its citizens. Thank you, Rebecca. You're Briefly, sorry. I would just respond to the, to the lady who asked a question about cooperation. I'm very optimistic, you know, as, and we see this cooperation at least at the level of our region as an opportunity to move forward and to create, as I said, or, or also to extend this partnership. You might, you might ask me how. I will say, First, by making better use of the existing tools. What we need to do is to change the mindset and the objective. Two, I think we should include, I like this concept of ownership, include the other players in our project, mm -hmm. civil society and business people and private mm -hmm. sector. It's very important. You see, I would just give a small example. Morocco has been very successful in the last 20 years as far as investment in Africa. You can't imagine we, had, we have now the knowledge, 
of the culture of the countries with whom we cooperate. We have Moroccans investing in banking, telephone, in water management, and it is a win-win partnership. People are making money, the private sector is making money. And this, I think, this is the, the vision behind His Majesties, you know, that we have to, of course, have the vision, have the tools, have the government, but also have the private sector. Because the private sector, they bring the investment. And now they're investing. There's a big competition as far as. And I agree with the, uh, uh, that also airlines. We know today the Moroccan company, Huayla Maroc, is making the best prof profits from Western Africa. So, you know, when you want to invest, you have to take the risk. And the risk, we have to take it, all of us, private, public sector. And I think I'm very optimistic as far as the, as the, as the future in our region. We need to reinforce the existing capaci capacities, tools, instrument, free trade agreement, and, say, uh, and et cetera. But we, we need also to associate other sectors. Because in Africa today, civil society is very important. The role of women is essential, it's crucial for the economic development, you know? So must give in, we must give it the priority, because they create also wealth. So I'm very optimistic. I think the cooperation uh, will continue, will, uh, will be successful if we have, we have the necessary uh, finance and so on. Great. Thank you, Yusuf. We'll take some questions from this side. Uh, you have a question? You can I tell us, please, who you are. Um, Fatia from Story School at the UM6P. Um, thank you for your enriching conversation. Considering the diversions of uh, interests and expectations, uh, we are living in a world full of action, um, so fast and dynamic that is hurting many along the way. Uh, from your global perspective, uh, how do you think we can stop considering North and South from a political and geographical perspective and start using the opportunities to overcome all the challenges we're all facing. Thank you. Great. We'll take some more questions. Here's a, here. This to you first and then. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. I have a chipkin from South Africa, um, which has come up a little bit. One of the things that I think might be of value in this South-South uh, Atlantic dialogue space is just sharing, just sharing information. I was just thinking about some of the speakers in relationship to experiences of weakening democracy and developing measures, for example, or anticipating democratic weakness. Uh, in South Africa, uh, some of us have been involved in the major struggle against what we call state capture, which has become an international phenomenon. Uh, a huge social movement developed in that, in, in that space, which uh, interrupted it. I would like to say defeated it, but didn't defeat it, but has interrupted it, certainly. An enormous amount of technical work has also been done in that space regarding measuring, anticipating, uh, uh, a warning around weak democratic weakness, for example. My question to you, though, is this. In this general context of a weakening of democracies, as you've framed it, how, how do you explain, just at, at a high level, what are some of the key things that we, you think we should be looking out for in terms of uh, uh, what is driving uh, the fragility of democracy in so many of our locations? Okay. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Uh, really interesting presentations. I'm Gustavo de Carvalho from the South African Institute of International Affairs. Um, we, you, you were talking a lot about uh, uh, different and divisions of positions within certain regions, and, and, and I think that it's true, but, uh, but I think there is, we do have an opportunity to identify some of those common denominators, not only within regions, but amongst regions. But I think there is a few problems with that. Uh, one, we, we talk about avoiding reinventing the world, but we should also rise certain institutions from, from the dead. One of them is the Africa-South America Summit. We haven't had one in over 10 years. Yes. Uh, it is a particularly important space not only to create those conversations where you can find points in common, but also identifying areas of investments. We talk a lot about the issue of connectivity via flights, but we can talk about uh, uh, undersea cables in terms of connectivity. It's, it's laughable when we're looking to a world map with all of the undersea cables and how few cables are connecting, for instance, South America and Africa. But also looking into interesting variations and creative ways of increasing collaboration. St. Vincent and the Grenadines, one of the smallest Caribbean countries, one of the smallest countries in the world to ever been in the Security Council, did something really interesting a couple of years back. Understanding that, according to the Africa Union, the diaspora is considered to be the sixth region of Africa, 
throughout two years, we didn't have the A3 anymore, the three African countries. We had the A3 plus one, where St. Vincent and Grenadine realized that it could gain much more leverage and voice within the Security Council by engaging with African actors. So I think there is more than can be done. I think our institutions in Africa and the institutions in Latin America should think more carefully about South-South cooperation beyond this once-off, very specific programmatic initiatives and really start a place in that within our strategic thinking and how we see ourselves in a, in a global order that is not only unstable, it's perhaps uh, are targets in developing countries in a much harder way uh, as we sit now. Thank you. Great. Uh, we'll take one more question before we t take it to the panel. And by the way, thanks for reminding me about uh, the Caribbean. Is there anyone in the audience from the Caribbean who would like to uh, ask a question? I'll come to you in a minute. Okay. You had a question? Very quickly. Mr. Ambrani, my question is to you. Recently, there has been the widening of the BRICS to six countries, then to 15 countries. 15 countries are knocking on the door. Uh, so this is a new force in emergence. How do we consider all that is in emergence, and, and rightly so, the, in uh, the uh, Atlantic uh, space? Number of questions and comments, uh, please, uh, whichever you want to well, address. I just want to answer to the last, two last questions about uh, the enlargement of BRICS. It is true that uh, during the last summit of Johannesburg, some decision has been taken by head of every state to enlarge to some countries. But, and I'm speaking under the control of two South African friends, they haven't agreed on the criteria. It was a political decision, yes, without consultation with the member countries, and some countries now are reviewing, right? Their, their membership to the BRICS. So this is something which is not decided uh, because they, when we ask the South Africans and other countries about the criteria, why they, haven't, why they have chosen Egypt, Saudi, or they say, no, it is for the political, there is no. They are still discussing the issue. So this issue is not closed. But anyhow, BRICS is an initiative that uh, uh, is trying, you know, according to some specific agendas to review, but there's still a lot of divisions within the BRICS as far as how to move forward. Uh, thank you. So we, have, we don't have a tremendous amount of time left. I wonder if uh, the panelists can keep your responses a little brief so we can get okay. a little bit more people, uh, members of the audience in. Thank you. Okay. Really quickly on, on the fragility, the question about the fragility of democracy, I think a lot of it has to do with economic performance, particularly post-COVID when the middle class um, contracted so much. There was a correlation um, with that and a, a decline in, in, in kind of the credibility um, of democracy to provide you know, something very basic, um, like the ability to, to, to make a living, the ability to find, find employment. Um, and I also think another, another challenge, of course, is, is something that Erica mentioned, which is social media, um, kind of the spread of disinformation. Um, and just, I think that's also been a, a huge factor um, in, in the fragility of democracy. Uh, thank you very much, Rebecca. Uh. Um, so on the two earlier questions, um, yes, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. There are several mechanisms. I absolutely echo your suggestions, which I think some have talked about already, which is the summit between South America and, and Africa. Um, let's make it a call to action for all of us here. We have different realms of action. Let's try to make it happen because it's definitely, it's overdue. And it forces all of this in the agenda of the leader. So I think wonderful. And on the first question, um, how do you make sure that our actions are not affecting the world? I think that by including young leaders such as yourself. And that is a task that it's nice to say, but in practicality, there's little room to make sure that young leaders are included, but they are the ones, when you measure and you survey, the ones who are more aware for things of like climate change that we obviously mentioned. When you survey, who's actually more aware and willing to do the work is the younger generations. Terrific. Thank you, Erica. We want to go to the question, but before we uh, ask your question, we want to get the audience involved in one final 
uh, word cloud question, um, a sort of interactivity, not exactly a word cloud. But if you would take out your apps and, um, uh, and ask, uh, there's a question. Oh, wow. I uh, want, want to get a sense of, uh, Yusuf talks a lot about his optimism. I want to see if the audience is optimistic as well. So I guess so far, uh, we are um, even in terms of whether or not you are convinced about uh, the future of this, uh, whether this renaissance that's happening in, um, in Africa and Latin America is real. Okay, question? Hi. And if you could identify yourself, please. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Shadia Mather. I'm from the island of St. Lucia and an Adele 2023 fellow. Uh, initially, the, as it concerns the conversation of a global South Renaissance, the Caribbean seems to be an afterthought um, in discussions plagued by big things, big data, who are the powers, and so as small island developing states, we are often left on the fringe of the conversation. So thank you to Gustavo for roping us in. Uh, even then, allow me to more forcefully position the Caribbean uh, in this conversation. Uh, I wish to propose a more kinetic Africa-Caribbean partnership that sees the elements or issues of African and Caribbean development as simultaneous equations that need to be solved. And I agree with the speaker who said that if we look for issues to solve uh, and work on them together, then they can be solved. Um, and I think a partnership like that will see the vastness of the African continent, the economic strength of Africa, the often underestimated economic strength of the Caribbean, and African and Caribbean civil society, young social entrepreneurs such as myself, uh, as complementary elements that will allow for quicker, more powerful, and more affordable solutions for both regions. This is, these are my promulgations, but I would like to ask you, how do you see uh, a more kinetic Africa-Caribbean partnership uh, in shaping this global South Renaissance that we've been talking about. Thank you. Terrific, thanks. Glad we got uh, the, South of Saint, the voice of uh, St. Lucia represented. Uh, there was a question here. Bonjour. Good afternoon, Hassan Saudi. I am the, from the Royal Institute of Strategic Studies. I'd like to ask the following question to Mr. Ambassador Lamrani with respect to this Af Atlantic Africa. You have uh, been in South Africa and uh, seen from here, we are under the impression that this country, South Africa, is uh, uh, casting its eyes elsewhere. Your optimism that I know, which is inveterate, do you think that South Africa really would really come back to this very important structure? So this is the sole question that I wanted to go to table. Thank you. Here. Oui, ça va? Okay, it's on. Okay, my name is. <coughs> I'm Selim Florence, I'm from Spain. Well, it, mm, it seems to me very clear that we are <coughs> excuse me, uh, in the process of regionalization of the world economy, and therefore, uh, it is almost uh, obvious after the COVID pandemic, with the interruption of the supplies and things like that, and this uh, phenomenon of uh, near shoring, etc. Uh, and it is clear that an area of regional uh, integration will take shape in the Americas, for example. It's obvious in North America, and probably it will in include the rest of the Americas. Uh, it is obvious that it is underway, of course, in the European Union since 60 years now. And uh, with the Euro-Mediterranean, uh, it is underway after 30 years now. And in my sense, uh, the best future for the rest of Africa is to be included in that area uh, with, uh, I mean, a European, Mediterranean, African uh, region in the world, as some areas are taking shape in Southeast Asia, etc. But are all uh, uh, actors intervening? We see the Chinese uh, trying to get gold in the rest of Africa, or the Russians uh, in the Sahel, etc. Uh, how do you see this, uh, the best possibilities, especially Ambassador Ambrani, who has this uh, 
uh, very deep African experience, and now we will be seeing this from the other side of the Atlantic. How do you see the best possibilities of sub-Saharan Africa? In which, which is their future? Uh, which is the best way they could really integrate in a positive way in, in the world economy? Because uh, they, they have to have special allies to do that. Which way you assess is best to go? Uh, and that's a question, of course, to the rest of the panel, too. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have one, uh, one more question. We'll take the last two questions. Right? Yeah. Good morning. My name is uh, Dr. Serin Yejov. I'm a former minister from Senegal, former director of uh, Nestle Research Center. I have uh, just uh, to, uh, a question on uh, with Moroccan investment. I, I think uh, in uh, today, Morocco is giving uh, the good example of investment, private investment in, in Senegal and in West Africa. And I think this global uh, South collaboration will only have uh, a meaning if we have actions like that. Because one of the needs to, uh, for Africa is actually having investment, technology transfer, to make sure that we are not only importing goods from Europe, but we are manufacturing goods, vehicles and chemistry, drugs and things like that. So the, my question is how this uh, SAF dialogue can increase investment, can help Africa to, be, to produce more? This is one question. The second question is about uh, diplomacy. African Union and this uh, ZELECAF, the, this zone of libre exchange. I've, in my opinion, this is very important that Africa has a political, like the European Union, a political center to think about African uh, also issues and also to encourage as well uh, trade, internal trade in, in Africa. And uh, Morocco, I think, must play a key role. So what role Morocco can play and what role also this uh, dialogue uh, uh, if between uh, the South can also play into fostering investment in Africa. Thank you very much. Terrific. Uh, our final <coughs> question. And if I can ask um, the organizers to put that poll back up uh, on um, uh, whether the audience is, there we go, is optimistic about the future. I'd like to keep that up as we wrap up the, the session. Hello, everyone. I'm Marcos from Nicaragua. I'm also part of the Atlantic emerging leaders for 2023. I'm currently based in Panama. I work as in corporate finance for the Liberty Global Corporation based in US. So I couldn't agree more with the uh, Honorable Ambassador who mentioned very important points for example, the role of private sector, rule of law, having correct institutions, right? But I'm also keen to hear from your experiences about from the fact that I think multilateralism has failed at least in Nicaragua, we know what has happened in the past five years, but also other, other nations. So two, two, point, two, two questions. First, what initiatives do you have in mind for multilateralism to gain that relevance? You mentioned the, uh, the democratic the charter, and that's one of the points that some countries have got withdrawn from the OES without any consequences. And second point, for the private sector, what policies specifically do you have for private sector and private finance to drive growth and make markets more competitive and regulation less costly? Thank you. Okay, panelists, uh, you take which of the questions uh, you're most comfortable and I, I will, uh, we'll go from there. If you allow me, I will just uh, respond to three questions. Quickly. First to my colleague, friend, Senen Florenza, who is the, uh, that we've been working together for the last 20 years, I think. I think uh, we should continue our di dialogue between Africa and Europe, okay, but with I mean, more concrete projects. We, didn't need, we don't need any more political dialogue meeting in Brussels once uh, every uh, two years, and we need concrete projects. I know Europe is committed to accompanying, and they have some tools, they have some new initiative, what, what do you call that, gateway? Global Gateway, I, f I forgot about Europe now, finished. <laughs> Global Gateway, and these initiatives can help uh, uh, to strengthen the cooperation. I think uh, about the question of my colleague about uh, South Africa and, uh, and the Atlantic, South Africa has participated in, two, in the two last meet ministerial meetings in Morocco about the Atlantic. I was talking only three days ago with the foreign minister of uh, Mrs. Pando of South Africa, and I put her the, the issue, the importance of the Atlantic, and she, she, she seems to be, 
convinced, but also she needs some coherence between what we are doing at the level of the African Union. As far as my uh, colleague from, uh, he asked a very important question from Nicaragua, saying that uh, uh, just to pick up an uh, uh, issue uh, that can be a priority. I think migration could be a priority between, in our dialogue between uh, Africa and Latin America. I served in a new country as ambassador from Mexico. I know Nicaragua very well. I think this issue for you, for Guatemala, for all the Central American countries is a priority also for our colleagues from the US and Mexico. So I think uh, 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 migration and how we should deal with this, I think with the com comprehensive approach, which uh, uh, contains three, I think, three okay. main, okay. Three main elements. Oh, three <laughs> main, just finished. Three main elements. Fight against illegal migration, facilitate legal migration, and economic and human development. Okay, Rebecca. Thank Rebecca. I think I have 35 <laughs> seconds, but I want to split it with you, so we'll have 15 each. Um, just, I just want to, um, um, our, our colleague from Nicaragua, say that, um, I hope we can talk separately. We have a Nicaragua working group at the Inter-American Dialogue, and um, I think you're right. The international system has, has failed in Nicaragua. The, the Nicaragua is one of the three full-blown dictatorships that I mentioned um, at the get-go. Um, and then, I just really quickly, I want to commend the, the Caribbean voice, St. Lucia, I think that you, this is one of the big ideas, right, that I think you came up with um, that we've been looking for. Um, and I think it also um, builds on Erica's point about kind of the young, the, the young leaders that are here. And I just, I've had a chance to meet m many of you, and I just, I, it, I feel hopeful for the future. And so maybe when we, if we put that poll up, if we have more young leaders' voice, I think that there might be more, more hope. And finally, nearshoring. Um, I think that that pre presents a, a, an opportunity in the Western Hemisphere for the U.S. to, to actually, as it moves supply chains, but I think it's an opportunity that, that is not um, being fully, fully taken advantage of. Erica? Thank you. Um, so very quickly, I just wanted to address the issue on investment. I think that we often go into the cycle where a new leader comes in, he spends a couple of years paying money for feasibility study, and by the time something is ready, his term is done. Um, and, and this goes back to the sharing of information and finding funding which is out there available for countries to prepare their own projects. And that means feasibility on all aspects, environmental, financial. You can't expect investors to come in and then all of a sudden say, I am going to invest these millions or billions of dollars in infrastructure, which is what most of our countries need. So that large item needs to be developed on a thoughtful manner, on a way that is presentable and sellable for all of our countries in order to actually foster that growth and development that we need. Okay. Well, first, two things. First of all, thank you for being a fantastic audience. Really appreciate it. And secondly, please join me in thanking this great panel. I think now we uh, have I'll lunch. Take a picture, I think. Oh, okay. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for taking part in this morning's sessions. We invite you all to join us for a networking lunch at Le Jardin de la Mamounia. Policy basin. Center for the we're New open, South Colleagues, candid, wherein white lanyards will guide you to and from and the lunch. The issues. conference will begin Over at 2.30 p.m. in this ballroom. Gather from more than 80 countries to delve into this year's theme, a more assertive Atlantic, its meaning for the world. Same as every edition, the conference will allow for different session formats. Over 10 plenary sessions and 380 talks will be on the record available for streaming on the Policy Center's website. Two night owl sessions and over 15 thematic breakout dinners will be held in more intimate settings around the city of Marrakesh for off the record, frank, and uninhibited discussions. South-South cooperation, the future of multilateralism, international financial architecture, economic nationalism, democracy in crisis, technology for sustainable transition, BRICS and NATO enlargements, global governance, and education. Over 40 emerging leaders from across the Atlantic, selected from thousands of applicants, will join the conference after a three-day tailor-made leadership and networking program. To know more, visit our dedicated website, AtlanticDialogue.org.
Under the high patronage of His Majesty King Mohammed VI, the Policy Center for the New South is organizing the 12th edition of the Atlantic Dialogues Conference, its annual high-level gathering of influential public and private sector leaders from around the Atlantic Basin for open, candid, and informal discussions on cross-regional and cross-sectoral issues. Over 400 high-level participants will gather from more than 80 countries to delve into this year's theme, a more assertive Atlantic, its meaning for the world. Same as every edition, the conference will allow for different session formats. Over 10 plenary sessions and 380 talks will be on the record, available for streaming on the Policy Center's website. Two night owl sessions and over 15 thematic breakout dinners will be held in more intimate settings around the city of Marrakesh for off-the-record, frank, and uninhibited discussions. South-South Cooperation, the future of multilateralism, international financial architecture, economic nationalism, democracy in crisis, technology for sustainable transition, BRICS and NATO enlargements, global governance, and 